Hello and good evening. Um, as Andy said, my name is Martin Partridge. I'm the chair of the Yorkshire branch of Butterfly Conservation, as well as being the species writer for the Northern Brown Argus and the Brown Argus in Yorkshire. The text of which goes into our annual Butterfly and Moth report, which we co-publish with the Yorkshire Naturalist Union and the Yorkshire branch of Butterfly Conservation. So why the Brown Argus? It is a special little butterfly. It's often overlooked, but which has in the past suffered a huge decline in numbers. This is the little brown job, which was the species that got Patrick Barkham, the author of the Butterfly Isles, so hooked on butterflies from very early age. It all started for me seeing this butterfly sunning itself many years ago in a local wood close to where we used to live in Cambridgeshire. On moving back to the northeast, I was keen to explore Yorkshire and see some of its butterflies and their habitats. I asked one of my branch committee colleagues where I should go to see the Brown Argus, and Alan directed me to Ellerburn Bank near the Dolby Forest. So I headed down there during the peak flight season, a drive of some 90 minutes from my home. I spent a good couple of hours on this lovely site exploring, and I saw many butterflies, but unfortunately I didn't see any brown argus. So the following day, when I was back at work in Billingham in Teesside, I headed out for lunchtime walk with some of my colleagues to a brownfield site adjacent to where I worked, which was once an ICI chemicals site. This area itself is 78 acres of land with approximately four acres set aside as a biodiversity site. On this site, we've recorded 25 species of butterfly, which is probably the most species rich site this far north in England. We typically walk the same route each visit we go around the site, and this is now a regular transect walk for me during the summer. On this occasion, walking around, something very small and silvery grey caught my eye. It was flying fast and low over the ground, but never flying too far away. It finally stopped and perched on a blade of grass. Its wings opened, revealing itself to what I thought must have been a brown argus. It looked far too small to be a common blue. The excitement kicked in as I'd not expected to see one of these on my doorstep. He eventually closed his wings and gave me the chance to see to take some photographs of the underside, which allowed me to confirm our first sighting of the brown argus on this site. How long it had been there, we will never know. And this really started the real fascination for me with this butterfly and triggered a much greater investigation on how it had arrived in Teesside. So the following presentation I'm gonna give will take information from a number of sources we're very fortunate that a number of academic groups, in particular Professor Chris Thomas is at the University of York, have studied this butterfly. So I have some interesting findings that they've discovered to share with you. So let's start with a little bit of history. The brown argus was described back in 1775. It's a member of the blues, blue family, the Lycinidae and its Latin name, Aresia agestis. The scientific name Aresia is thought to come from the name of Aresia, the city of Latium, where there was a temple dedicated to Diana. Unfortunately, agestis has a very unclear derivation like many butterfly names. It's been suggested it was a typographic area, error and alludes to, in Latin, to the meadow habitats preferred by this butterfly. The past English common names given to butterflies and moths are obviously quite, are of, often quite interesting, and the brown argus is no different. It was first named the edged brown argus by James Pettifer in 1702, and the word edged is a compression of selvaged, the finished edge of a fabric, where the butterfly's orange crescents or lumules resemble the stitching, and the argus comes from the many-eyed shepherd of Greek mythology. You can see all the eyes on the underside of the wing here. The species later became the Argus blue, the brown blue, and finally it was settled on the brown Argus in 1803. So the first thing we have to be able to do is identify this butterfly in the field. 
This is not always straightforward, particularly if the site that you're on has common blue on it. So the two species are very similar in size. The brown argus perhaps a little bit smaller in its wingspan, but very small, 25 to 30 odd millimeters in size. If you do see the two side by side, it's quite often the brown argus is a little bit smaller, certainly from the ones that I've seen. It is quite possible for misidentification, meaning that over many years, the brown argus has may probably remain under recorded. Here we have photographs on the left of the brown argus and the female common blue on the right. Note the similarities. Both have the orange crescents, but the female common blue quite often has a little bit of white at the bottom of its crescents. The upper wings and around the thorax on the common blue can quite often be very blue, but sometimes you find them a little bit like this one where there's a powdery blue tinge on the, uh, on the abdomen and the forewing, but not much. You do have to be a little bit careful though, sometimes brown argus, especially fresh specimens, you do get a blue tint on them sometimes. The key bit of information, if they'll ever sit still for you and close their wings, is to look at the underside. And here on the brown argus in the forewing, you can see there is a dot missing in this first red circle. And on the common blue, there is a spot or an eye on this side. And the other distinctive marking typically you'll see on a well-marked brown argus is the colon arrangement of the two dots here on the hind wing, whereas they're more in a line on the common blue. Brown argus are typically bivoltine, they'll be brooded in a year. This chart was generated from data recorded on the biodiversity site in Teesside that I mentioned earlier during the wonderful summer of 2019. So some sites in the UK do see much higher populations of the brown argus in the August time frame rather than the May one. But in this one, we actually see very good numbers in both the broods in the middle to end of May and the middle of August. Certainly these days, the number of broods in a season is not a great indicator of being able to tell species apart as it's affected by climatic conditions. And certainly last year in Yorkshire, we observed two broods of Northern Brown Argus, which is not always the case. Normally it's one. So butterflies can typically only colonize an area where they have food plants available. And the brown argus in the past was a very sedentary species found on warm south-facing chalk and limestone downs, typically in the south of England, where the colonies were largely supported by common rock rows, which would only grow on these soil types. However, like most things, there are some exceptions. Certainly at sites in the West Midlands, the brown argus has been found since the 19th century, where dove's foot, or cut-leaved cranes bill must have been the larval food plant as there were no, was no rock rose present. The cut-leaved cranes bill was established back in the 50s as a larval food plant along grassy south-facing embankments along the Thames estuary in Kent. In San June, the brown argus often utilizes the common stalks bill. On this photograph here, you can see the, the three species of um, geranium family, which the butterfly uses in this country, the dove's foot cranes bill on the left, cut leaf cranes bill in the middle, and common stalks bill on the right. And to show you the whole plant, what they'd look like um, if you saw them. It is important to note here that in continental Europe, plants from the geranium family are used as larval food plants quite normally. So now I'm going to discuss a little bit about the life cycle of the brown argus. Last year, I was very fortunate to spend 30 minutes watching a female brown argus seeking out suitable larval host plants and witness her egg laying. She flew relatively slowly, much more slowly than you would normally see them moving, 
and very low to the ground, seeking out the suitable plants. She was in a very single-minded pursuit. She seemed completely oblivious to my presence as I stood, watch, should, stood watching. She did visit many small plants and deposited a single egg on just a few. And these eggs, as you'll see in the next slide, are quite elaborate in design, but only half a millimeter in diameter. In these photographs here, you can see the female in the left-hand picture testing a very small dove's foot crane's bill plant for suitability. Top right picture, she's now curling her abdomen underneath, and I was able to turn the leaf over to find the single egg that she just laid. For the pictures on the next slide, I'm very grateful to Peter Eels for allowing me to use them. Many of you, if you've got a copy of his book, will recognise them. They're featured in his wonderful book called The Life Cycles of British and Irish Butterflies. So once the brown argus has laid the eggs, it takes between one and three weeks for these eggs to hatch. The caterpillar goes through five instars, an instar being a phase between the maltings. And each phase is typically lasts between seven and 10 days in length. And you can see here, you can see the elaborate design of the egg, half a millimeter in diameter. The first instar here, two millimeters in size, second and Third instars look very similar and are between three and five millimeters. These little windows here are where they've been feeding on the underside of the leaf. Gets up to about six and a half millimeters at fourth instar. And finally, the fifth instar, the caterpillar feeds more out in, in the open and reaches somewhere around 11 millimeters in size. Now the caterpillar overwinters either as a second or third instar caterpillar before completing its moltings the following spring and pupating. If you look at the two pictures of pupa here that Peter's got, the first one looks very, very similar to the fifth instar. You can still see the colouring, the purple stripe down its uh, side. And the second pupa image is probably just before it's about to hatch. So you can see the very strong dark brown wing, even the black spot in the forewing, and you can see the orange crescents in the wing. This process in pupation typically only lasts two to three weeks. Now I'm not going to cover it today, but like many species of the blue uh, butterfly family, the caterpillar and pupa are known to be tended by ants where they use complex chemical and acoustic signals to manipulate the ants, which are often found in attendance, but are not absolutely critical. So now we're going to talk a little bit more about distribution. The next few slides I'm going to share with you are built from data supplied by Butterfly Conservation, which go back as far as the first records they have in 1826, where the Brown Argus was recorded along the Thames estuary. The data is manipulated in QGIS, Quantum Geographical Information Systems, which is a wonderful piece of freeware and is relatively easy to use. You can access vast amounts of free mapping layers onto which you can display your geographical data. I taught myself how to use this during lockdown last year, and there are some excellent tutorials to help you online. Certainly a very useful tool. So the first map covers a vast time span, 1826 from the first record down in uh, the Thames estuary, all the way up to 1980. But it shows the butterfly did not get much further than Lincolnshire and North Wales. In fact, those Lincolnshire um, squares there, actually the butterfly became extinct in Lincolnshire back in the 1960s. The butterfly suffered enormous losses during this earlier part of the 20th century and they experienced a more than 40% decline in numbers up to the 1980s. This was partially as a result of the elimination of many rock rose sites from the calcareous grasslands after being ploughed up or because of the application of fertilizers. We now add 10 more years to this. The map now covers all the data from 1826 to 1990. This shows the first record of brown argus in Yorkshire 
in the Wolds, north of Hull, and that'll be on common rock roads. And the final map at this scale I'm going to show you shows the distribution up to 2000. So we've started to fill in a bit more in Yorkshire. There's quite a lot more on the north coast of Wales, on the south coast of Wales, and coastal regions of southwest England, and a lot of infilling into the mainland part of uh, the south and east of England. Note where it is on the coast, it really has not made many in, much inroad inland at all, and, uh, and that remains to the case today. So now we're going to shift and take a closer look at the northeast. To help with the geography of the northeast, I'll put this first slide in to show the major cities and locations, as well as the naming convention of vice counties for the area, for those who may not be familiar with this terminology. So you'll hear me mention Teesside a few times, County Durham, and uh, obviously the, uh, the main cities of Yorkshire, York, Leeds, Sheffield, Doncaster and Hull. So the Brown Argus distribution data is displayed as orange coloured two kilometre by two kilometre squares or tetrads. And this is the first data of the first sightings of the Brown Argus in Yorkshire. The time frame in each case is displayed on the top left hand corner of the map. Orange data is that time frame and any black data is from the previous slides data. So if we move on, so that first sighting was 1983 in the Wolds, we move on to 1991 to 1995. There are a few new colonies appearing in the Wolds and there is, um, but uh, it's not appearing anywhere else. 1996 to 2000 shows further local colonies appearing in the Wolds as they're spreading um, to adjacent sites. And it's now being recorded in Southwest Yorkshire, VC 63 for the first time. 2001 to 2005 saw a massive expansion with new colonies being found in south of Yorkshire, but also now in West Yorkshire in VC 64 and North Yorkshire VC 62. With some quite high up in uh, towards um, the north end of Yorkshire. 2006 is a big year because it's the first time the Brown Argus was sighted north of the Tees in County Durham, as well as now being in Northwest Yorkshire as well. 2007 saw the species recorded even further north in County Durham. And 2008 to 10 saw a consolidation around the Tees estuary particularly. And this probably was helped by a number of the many brownfield sites which exist in this area on both sides of the Tees. And when we move on from 2011 to present day, these now show the brown argus has been recorded at sites where we would expect to see northern brown argus colonies as well. So from the first record in Yorkshire in 1983, down in the Wolds, to its most northerly sighting now in County Durham, the brown argus has traveled more than 114 kilometers or 71 miles. To today. This equates to an average of 3.1 kilometres a year or 31 kilometres a decade northwards. This is quite a range, a rate of regional expansion. More typical numbers in the literature for butterflies are something around 17 kilometres per decade. So this tiny little butterfly has moved at something like 1.8 times faster than is typically seen for a butterfly. So what has caused this? Well, it's a combination of factors and it appears uh, appear to be responsible for this rapid recovery and the expansion north. First of all, we'll look at weather. This graph from the Met Office shows the mean maximum temperature for summers over the last 130 years. If we take a look at the right hand side of the chart from 1990 to 2020, I'm looking at the blue area that I've highlighted here. 
This dotted line is the trend line for the average temperature. It indicates over the past three decades, we've gone from something like 19.8 degrees centigrade to 20.5 degrees centigrade, a rise of 0.7 degrees centigrade, which is quite a lot. As I've previously stated, since rock rose nearly always grows in distinctly warmer situations than the geranium plants in our countryside, and are most abundant on south facing slopes, then you'd expect the large majority of brown algas colonies, which were historically restricted to these warm slopes. And in the past, there were only a few locations where the geranium species grew and the microclimate was warm enough for the brown algas to breed. As the climate in Wales and England has become warmer, numerous sites with geranium species plants on that were until recently too cool, have become available for breeding both within and to the north of the brown argus's traditional range, therefore allowing the brown argus to extend its range. Many of these potential new breeding sites were generated when the common agricultural policy was introduced in 1992, which had farmers setting aside 15% of their land in order for them to qualify for subsidies. Although a number of these set aside fields were probably ploughed up each year, a good number were left fallow, allowing the Dove's Foot, Crane's Bill and Common Stork's Bill to develop vast populations across large areas of the country. A number of habitats where you are likely to see the brown argus has a result grown enormously with this shift to alternative larval food plants. And this now will include woodland clearings, heathland, disused quarries, sand dunes, arable field margins, brownfield sites, road verges and disused railways. Not many areas you wouldn't expect to find them. I per personally witnessed how quickly Dove's Foot Cranes Bill can spread on a site. On the biodiversity site in Teesside mentioned earlier, in the first year we found the brown argus in 2018, we found very few Dove's Foot Cranes Bill plants. But by 2020, the site had numerous areas covered with the high density of this plant. The widespread nature of the geranium species compared to the common rock rose is clearly seen when you map the locations of the four species of host plant in the north of England. And the data I'm going to show you comes from the National Biodiversity Network database. But please note the absence of records does not necessarily reflect absence of plants, just absence of records in this database. So first of all, the slide below shows the bedrock geology of the northeastern part of England, and this comes from the B British Geological Survey website. The chalk and limestone type bedrocks, of which there are a number in, uh, in this area, are displayed as pale green for the Wolds area, large bands of turquoise here, and the yellow on the map. And it's important you remember those colours because you'll see why in a second. We can now overlay a distribution map of the common rock rows which clearly shows it growing only on the limestone and chalk areas of the northeast region. In a study by a group from York University, the rock rose sites were found to achieve much higher local densities of plants when compared with Dubs Cranesville, over 23 times greater per 100 square metre sample. And the long lived perennial rock rose was found to have a much more stable population than does an annual Dove's Foot Cranes Bill. So these differences allow rock rose sites to support larger and more stable populations of brown argus. If we move to the next map, we can now see the three geranium species with the Dove's Foot Cranes Bill dominating these sites all across Yorkshire. And finally, an overlay of the two sets of larval food plant species for comparison. So it's not difficult to see, with the geranium plants being so readily available across most of Yorkshire, if the microclimate is right, the brown argus would spread relatively easily, as they did not have large distances to disperse to reach new potential sites. In a separate study, the same group looked to see if there was a preferred host plant. The host plant preference was measured by estimating the average number of eggs laid by free-flying females on greenhouse-grown host plants. 
The study was carried out over 15 different sites in the UK, and these sites were chosen being a mixture of recently colonised sites and long established sites, which were dominated by either common rock rose or one of the geranium species. The study was carried out with the second broods of the butterfly each year, so late July to early September, and was carried out over a three year period. A sample of each of the geranium species and the common rock rose were randomly positioned, one at each corner of the 50 by 50 centimetre square, with 16 to 24 squares on each of the 15 different sites. The plants were left in situ for seven to 21 days and then collected. The number of eggs were laboriously, uh, the number of eggs laid on the host plants were laboriously counted and, uh, and estimated. What the researchers discovered was that at long established sites, the host plant preference generally matched the local dominant host plant. So if rock rose was the locally dominant species, the female brown argus preferred that plant on which to lay eggs. On long established sites where there was a very low preference, on long established sites, there was a very low preference for locally absent rock rose. So if the site had geranium species on it and rock rose was introduced for the experiments only, there was a very low preference for the females to lay on it. What they consistently found on new, newly colonized sites, there was a very strong preference for the dove's foot cranes built at all sites. In this same study, the group sought to see if there was a difference in the ability for the butterfly to disperse. Now, previous studies on a number of butterfly species, including the speckled wood, have used thorax mass as a good proxy for flight muscle mass, as all the flight muscles are contained in the thorax. Forewing surface area has also been used as another indicator of flight dispersal ability. So five sites were chosen and females were caught and placed individually under cages on their own site on natural patches of the host plant to lay eggs. The eggs were reared to adults to estimate the genetic differentiation in relative thorax mass and forewing surface area. The only significant finding was that the thorax sizes of females originating from recently colonized sites were significantly larger for those on long established populations. The male did show a similar trend, but it was nowhere near as significant. And the four wing size was not significantly correlated with either the colonization, colonization history or the place host plant. This piece of work has reinforced that the adaptation to climate change has involved the selective spread of a genotype or form of brown argus that prefers the most widely geographically spread host plant. And they have a higher dispersal ability than a more sedentary form, which would typically live on rock rows. Another factor which also needs to be considered is the effects of parasites on the larvae of the brown argus. Research carried out by Rosa Menendez and others showed the brown argus larvae suffered lower mortality from parasites in newly colonized areas when compared with long established populations. This reduced parasitism occurred despite the fact that several parasitic species associated with the brown argus were already present on the newly colonized sites, supported predominantly by the presence of the common blue. These two small um, parasitic wasps, the one on the left, was found to be the dominant parasite at established sites, and the one on the right was found to be more abundant on recently colonized sites. Now these are very small in size, they're about seven millimeters long. A total of 16 sites across the range of brown argus were chosen for this um, study, where they used long established sites and others from more recently colonized sites. The wild caterpillars, either second or third instar, were collected from the field and reared in the lab to produce either adult butterflies or the parasitic wasps. And this was carried out over three consecutive years using both broods of caterpillar. 
So the researchers concluded that the brown argus does appear to be partially escaping or running away from its parasites as it heads north. And this is probably, they believe, because the parasites, although present on the site, typically search on the food plant used by the caterpillar when searching for their host. So the parasite may not find the brown argus caterpillars because they're not actually looking in the right place. So with the brown argus moving north, it's beginning and has already encroached into the range of the much more sedentary northern brown argus, which exists on common rock roads. And I'll show this quite graphically when I show you this map here. This shows the northern brown argus connollys highlighted in turquoise uh, alongside the brown argus um, up to 2020 in orange. In County Durham, the sightings are now being made north of traditional northern brown argus colonies, and in northwest Yorkshire, the brown argus and northern brown argus populations are now only kilometres apart at the closest point. So now we have a much more difficult identification problem on our hands. How do we tell if we can the brown argus and northern brown argus apart? This is where visual identification distinguished between the two becomes near on impossible, particularly in the Northeast region of England. And I'll give you some examples here. So here on the left-hand side of this slide, our brown argus um, male taken on the uh, biodiversity site in Billing. And this is the underwing side of it with not very well expressed uh, eyes. And then three relatively different northern brown argus um, species from uh, various sites uh, around the north of our region, BC 64 up to uh, two of the famous sites in County Durham, Bishop Midland Quarry and Castle Eden Dean. If you go further north still, the white spot in the wing tends to be more and more obvious, uh, but typically the orange crescents tend to become less and less obvious. So the flight period and the um, number of broods are becoming more and more blue, blurred as well as climate change, um, due to climate change. And as the species are potentially appearing at the same site, the presence of the host plant is not always a clear indicator of which species is which either. So the only real way to tell them apart is through genetic analysis. And we're quite fortunate, this, some of this has been carried out by a couple of groups over the past 20 years and I'm briefly going to discuss their findings at a relatively high level. So the studies on different populations of brown argus and northern brown argus at both recently colonized and long established sites in the UK and also across sites in Europe has been carried out. And the first set of studies by Agard and colleagues back in the early 2000s showed there were only two species of Aresia in Northwestern Europe, the Northern Brown Argus and the Brown Argus as we know them today. Dismissing the claims for many subspecies and also the previous belief that the Scottish species was endemic to the UK. Their studies proposed that the Brown Argus extended up as far as Ford and Bank in the Wolds, which is labeled here as FDB. And these, the brown argus is represented by the dark colored squares on the uh, map. And populations from Thrislington, which is close to Bishop Middleham Quarry in County Durham, and here in the circle with the dots, and north from there are brown argus. And of course, there is a diagonal line here because it covers the Lake District populations are also considered to be brown argus as well. Interestingly, this work quotes a previous study that in Jailand, north, the northern part of Denmark, the islands east of Denmark and Sweden, the bivoltine, the, the, the double brooding brown argus and the univoltine, northern brown argus, actually coexist in a mosaic type fashion in these areas. And the genetic studies carried out by Agard and the team also suggested these are actually quite distinct species at these locations and there is no evidence of hybridization from the samples they took. So very clear brown argus, brown argus, northern brown argus. 
In the Peak District in Yorkshire, they concluded that these butterflies that were collected possessed genetic characteristics that suggested that there had actually been some past interbreeding. Now, at the time of this study, there were no colonies of brown algas close to the northern brown algas ones, as there are now today, so they could not have been studied. A more recent pop, uh, publication by Mallet and Thomas in 2010 found there to be a band of approximately 150 to 200 kilometers marked between these two uh, squiggly lines here, where there was a mixture of genetic variations found, a hybrid band. This time yellow circles represents the northern brown algus and the dark blue circles the pure brown algus. Hybrid uh, colonies are shown as a mixture of the two. The timing of this past introgression or transfer of genetic information is not known. Virtually all of the land currently populated by brown, northern brown argus and much of the land occupied by the hybrid, hybrid populations lay under ice around 20,000 years ago. So the oldest possible date for the current position of the hybrid populations would be around 11 and a half thousand years ago. Up until the late 20th century, of course, these hybrid populations were absolutely distinct from pure brown argus in the south and northern brown, po uh, brown argus populations. So there was little or no gene flow between the two. Therefore, the conclusion was the populations of the hybrid origin arose hundreds, if not thousands of years ago. It's not possible to identify which species each population in the zones of uh, mixture in Northern England contain because they contain a mixture of Northern and Southern origin genes. What we also don't know is if this rapidly moving form of the brown argus is actually a mixture of these genes. Could it have actually come from much further south and overtaken through this hybrid population? We don't know. So I'm just drawing it to a close. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. In conclusion, the brown argus has evolved quickly to make use of other geranium species food plants in a response to climate change. And in doing so has undergone a rapid range expansion over the past 40 years. The butterfly, if given a choice, will more often than not choose the widely distributed dove's foot cranes bill over the other food plants. The female brown argus on newly colonized sites have significantly greater dispersal ability than the more sedentary ones found on rock rose sites. Interbreeding has occurred, albeit probably a long time ago, to create a hybrid band across part of Northern England. And in the future, we may see the formation of a new hybrid species, or the two species may actually coexist like they do in Denmark, or Maybe worse, we may see the elimination of one, and it quite possibly could be the northern brown argus. Only time and probably some additional genetic analysis will tell us more of the story. So finally, I've got quite a few acknowledgements to make. Thank you to Butterfly Conservation and all the VC recorders for sharing their brown argus and northern brown argus data. And without the various academic groups for their research, there wouldn't be all these insights. So thank you to them. And I'd like to thank you all for listening. And if anybody wants to contact me, that's my email address at the bottom. Right, thank you very much indeed, Martin. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, an excellent presentation with some fascinating science aspects to it uh, in terms of investigating what's been going on. Um, I'd just like to hand over now to Mark, who's keeping an eye on the chat. We've not got a, a flood of questions, but we've got a few, I think. So, uh, Mark, would you like to, to deal with those? Uh, I would love to, Andy. I don't have any questions at the moment. Have they come straight to you? Uh, oh, right. <laughs> I haven't seen any to, to me, so <laughs> you might have to do the honours yourself, I'm afraid. Right, okay. I answered everything, obviously. Uh, yes. Very good, Martin, yeah. <laughs> okay. um, right, let's just see. Northern brown argus and brown argus. This was a question from David, um, both found in County Durham. Is there hybridization occurring? Well, I think you've 
you said a little bit about that. I don't know whether you wanted to uh, elaborate at all. I think it's a good question. I mean, I know uh, if it's David Phillips who perhaps asked the question. Um, I think one of the difficulties we've got now with obviously records coming from up there is to be sure whether they're Northern Brown or Brown Argus. And I guess that's a difficulty that <laughs> without actually taking specimens from the wild and actually doing the genetic analysis on them, I'm not sure we'll know um, because uh, I think Bishop Middleham Quarry have had records of both, supposedly both species based on time of year. Um, so uh, are they hybrids? I think it's a question I, I, I'm still not sure about. It's a question that the genetic analysis so far in my mind possibly hasn't answered because um, if the brown argus is moving that fast, has it moved through Yorkshire? And, uh, and we, what are we seeing now? Is that, is that pure brown argus or is it, is it uh, being a less sedentary species? Is, is it a mixture of the two? But, uh, so yeah, it's gonna be very difficult as we've got records on both sites on sites now where you'd expect to see northern brown argus. Uh, what we're going to do about them both in County Durham in VC 66 and also in VC 65. So. Right, um, there's been a, a question. Um, do they migrate in other parts of the world? I suppose, are there evidence of movement of a similar nature going on? Well, That's a good question. I, I haven't found, I mean, it's only found in the, um, the sort of the western part of Europe um, that I've come, well, it's found in a lot of places, but there isn't much literature that I can find outside what's been done in the UK. Um, unfortunately, the papers in uh, Scandinavia, are, I couldn't get hold of them myself. I would like copies of them. If anybody can get hold of them for me, that would be great. Um, so, so I can add to my knowledge. But I, I don't know whether they've undergone the same what appears to be rapid movements that uh, they certainly appear to have done in the UK. So if anybody knows anything different, I'd love to hear from them. So, uh... Thank you, right. Um, oh, we've, we've uh, got a few more questions coming in. Um, David again, is um, he's sort of assuming the caterpillars are indistinguishable between the two species? Between the Northern Brown and the, and. No, they are supposed to be slightly different now. I think if you look in Peter Eels, Eels's book, they are a little bit different, but the problem with caterpillars, <laughs> like most things, they can they can vary in color quite quite considerably. So, uh, and uh, you're gonna have to do pretty well to go and find these things in the wild because they're not exactly very big. So, uh, so I'll, I'll get the colors the wrong way around, I think. The, the colours on the on the brown argus are, I think, a little bit more uh, bright, certainly the purple, the, the stripe is. So. And I think certainly one, one other comment that I know I've read in the past, if you see northern brown argus laying, supposedly they lay their eggs on the top of the leaf of the rock rose, whereas the brown argus lays under the leaf. On the, but I'm sure there are exceptions to that as well. So. Right. Thank you. Um, is there a trend to double uh, to, to do a double voltine on the northern brown argus in its southern locations? I think that comes. I mean, we had one record in northwest Yorkshire. Uh, we had very few records of northern brown argus last year, but that had a had its earliest ever sighting in the UK. I think it was the tenth of May from um, memory last year, and because of that early emergence of the first brood, we did actually appear to have got a second, just one single specimen was seen, which we think is probably a second brood Northern Brown Argus. I'm not aware in VC 66, maybe if somebody's on here that could correct me, but I'm not aware they've seen uh, bivoltine behavior in, uh, in VC 66. Right. So that may well be a, obviously a temperature. Yeah. Um, the situation again. So. Um, Victoria asks, is there any evidence that they'll lay eggs on cultivated varieties of rock rose plants? That I don't know. I'm not sure that, because uh, obviously there are plenty of those around in people's gardens, but uh, I really don't know the answer to that, whether anybody's actually tried to, uh, to get them. But butterflies, I mean, I remember an interesting story. Butterflies can be made to lay on all sorts of things if you let, if you leave them long enough. I mean, uh, there's a famous study by Lincoln Brower on the monarch butterfly where he managed to get them to lay on cabbages. 
to prove that uh, it could make a non-toxic caterpillar. So, uh, and he managed to breed them like that. So I'm not aware, um, but I've not seen anything that they would live on the varieties. Yeah. Um, Robert Bailey asks, is the brown argus switch of larval plant due to phenotypic plasticity? Adaptation, response to environments? Very much so, I think, yes. Brown yeah, argus populations already recorded as using yeah, I mean, I think all it did, it obviously flicked a switch, the temperature was right, and the brown argus was already using the geranium, as it does in most of Europe, and, and it was using it in pockets around the UK, so uh, it obviously didn't take much of a, an evolution for that uh, butterfly to switch over to a, a much more available food, series of food plants. So. Right. Um... Ajit asks, how do you differentiate between male and female? The easiest way to do it. Um, typically, the abdomen um, in the female is much plumper and shorter than a male, as you would see in most butterfly species. But quite often, you'll see more orange crescents on a female than you will on a male. So if you went back to my presentation the one that was egg laying it had all six of its four wing crescents were quite orange. A number of the other pictures I've got in there are of males where they don't have so many um, lunules, orange crescents, but that's no, by no means a clear way of telling them apart because you could see, I think I had one picture from VC64 where it had almost no orange crescents at all. So body shape is always the best way. So. Right. Uh, the northern brown argus ever been seen on dove's foot cranes bill i really don't know the answer to that obviously in the experiments um they only use brown argus but whether anybody's done any on northern brown argus i don't know right. um, but yeah it's an experiment to be done <laughs> yes okay um I think we've dealt with all the written questions uh i'm just going to stop the recording now um